And welcome back to the Cooler Jets podcast for us, Ben Blessington and Michael Nania. Well, Michael, another game, another podcast, another embarrassing Jets loss on national television full of meme-worthy plays, meme-worthy commercials with the head coach, just more national embarrassment in this season that has just been awful and disappointing. And I, we're running out of things to say. There's probably a broader discourse that a lot of Jets fans are having about the futures of Sala and Joe Douglas and Rodgers and all of this. So I guess we'll hop into that. But first, Michael, how are you doing? How was your Thanksgiving? It was pretty good. Um, I feel like the better, game better than a, your Black Friday. Better than my Black Friday, for sure. Although, I mean, I watched the game with my brother and my dad that came over to my apartment and we had a thrilling time watching the Jets as per usual. Uh, but yeah, it was a good weekend. Had some... Some more Twitter drama, as seems to be the usual for me um, <laughs> nowadays. This yeah, you year, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, yeah, I, I know you have been trying to take up that mantle. Sometimes I take your advice. Sometimes I just deny you, and I'm like, I don't need a publicist. But sometimes I feel like I do because I mean, this year has just been filled with those for me. But, Started um, with the Reddit guy. We can maybe maybe get into that a little bit later, but um. But yeah, another. I don't mean to say anything. Okay, you've, you've got you've you've come under a lot of fire, but I don't mean to say anything. Your takes have aged like fine wine this season, so you at least can hang your hat on that. If you ain't have haters, you ain't popping. One of many of Sala's great cliche yes. quotes, <laughs> and I know I know you've turned on Sala. Now we've talked about it every time I've turned, on the podcast. Yes, this is during I'm the, on the game. During the game, Sala squad. Hop <laughs> well, during the game, in. a lot of times you'll tweet things. Very, you know, you're angry, whatever, you're passionate. And then you will get on the podcast and be like, all right, the game's over. I've had a chance to sit back and reflect. And no, I don't think the Jets should kill everybody in their front office. And no, I don't think Zach Wilson deserves to go to prison. How do you feel about Sala after this one? Because you were tweeting some things during the game that it's just like the guy's 15 and 30. It's three years now of this. The product is unplayable. Um, we we were disagreeing over text. How do you feel about about Sala uh, a couple hours after this one? Yeah, I mean, you're right. There are a lot of times during games when I get very emotional, and I'll send you some texts that later on I read them, and I'm like, wow, I was overreacting. Because, um, you know, when you're in the middle of the game, you feel so helpless, and you're just watching your team get destroyed, and you feel like, oh, I want to blame someone for this. Someone's got to be held accountable. So there's, like, that emotion, and you – you know, it leads you to make some conclusions that sometimes later on you look back and you think about it more logically once the game is over and you're like, you know, that was over the line. But um, in this case, I feel like I am starting to lean towards the anti sala sort of side of the spectrum to the point where I feel like, you know, this is a unique situation that the Jets are in, obviously, with Aaron Rodgers and everything. But I personally, I feel like if I were in charge, I would do some house cleaning after the season, and I think he would be a part of it. I'm definitely getting to the point where it's hard to see him being the leader of a winning team. And I understand that a lot of the things that Jets are dealing with right now are beyond his control. There are a lot of mistakes Joe Douglas has made, for sure. There have been injuries. They're on their third quarterback, third player, various positions, especially on offense. A lot of tough things, for sure. But at the same time, I think, you know, you're – Year three at this point, and at the at the end of the day, the the product falls on the head on the head coach, and you look at the overall product with this team, and that's what I think this all comes down to is it just doesn't feel like a competent competitive team. And I know they're dealing with a lot of issues, like I said, but there are a lot of examples around the league of teams that are dealing with similarly difficult situations, and they're fighting through it. The Texans have a rookie quarterback, and they're six and four. The Browns have had injuries at quarterback, and when Sean Watson did play, he was terrible. And they've lost both their starting tackles, and they're 7-3. and three. The Vikings have Josh Dobbs, and they've lost Josh, uh, Justin Jefferson for about half the season. They're 6-5, and five, and they won most of those games without him. So there are a lot of examples. It doesn't always have to be you know, a perfect situation for you to win games. I know the Jets, every single year, year there's been some sort of explanation for it. It was rebuilding the first year as a young team. Last year, Brees and AVT got hurt. Zach Wilson sucked. And then this year, everything that's happened this year. But it doesn't – If you, it has to be perfect for you to win games. What are you bringing to the table? That's really what I'm at with Sal at this point because you're year three, and it feels like the only way they can win is if everything is pristine and perfect. 
And it doesn't really feel like that, you know, he's elevating the team in any way. He has all these mantras every single offseason, but we're still committing multiple bad personal fouls a game. His clock management management and his fourth down decisions are poor. Like coming into the season, uh, I believe last year, he was the worst coach in the league in terms of going forward on fourth down uh, when you should based on the win probability of go versus punt or kick field goal. Uh, this year, I feel like has been similar. Like there was a fourth and one in the first half where, and granted they were shallow yeah, they're on the on side of the field. 35 yards or something. On 30 or something, but it felt like a situation where they should have went. I mean, they went for a fake punt last week and it, later in the second quarter. It felt like a situation where it was like, okay, you give the ball back. They could score on you immediately. They get the ball second half. Like situations like that where you could see more aggressiveness. Um, and then I'm going to be completely honest. I think a lot of my solid aggression right now has to do with that commercial. I mean, come on. <laughs> Come on. I was about to Clearly say. You that, that during the, the season. Com- He's got the in-season beard. <laughs> All right, the commercial's your best argument. The commercial's your best <laughs> argument because clearly you filmed that over the bye or maybe – I don't know exactly when. But did you not know that – like you've been in New York for three seasons. You knew that that was just going to get thrown right in your face. Also, brilliant marketing by Colgate because I bet you they knew as well. It's like, okay, we're going to air this at the end of the season when the Jets suck and we get to do lol Jets and everybody's going to tweet this meme out. Barstool tweeted out. Jets fans will tweet it out. Great marketing for Colgate. I have it as my background on the podcast. The, the, the Colgate commercial was embarrassing. It was more embarrassing to me than the the pick six on the Hail Mary that preceded it. That play was unlucky, unfortunate, but like, all right, I've st- it was a good play with the Dolphins. That. Like the fact that it's the first time we've ever seen it. Like if we were seeing it already, like whatever. But like the, we're de- debuting this commercial after you just threw. Uh, they're calling it the Hell Mary. Like come on. It's why crazy. do you think they chose Sala? Why do you think they? Why do you think Colgate chose Sala? Oh, Jets because they knew they were going to th- games. This they were going to throw in their face. <laughs> and you could throw it right in their face. If I mean, that's granted, Andy Reid, nobody gives a shit. He's feeling good. They probably just beat the Eagles. He did it after the bye week. He's like, all right, let's take advantage of being in New York. But I don't they know. knew exactly. It just what feels they were like doing a lack of awareness. So maybe it's sort of driven by that. But I don't know. I feel like here's what it comes down to for me. Even if Aaron Rodgers was with this team this year, they would be a better team, undoubtedly. But would they be a Super Bowl team? I don't. I definitely don't see that. I think maybe they'd be the 20th or so best offense, maybe a nine or 10 win team, maybe eight win team like he was last year. And receiver I don't, would be a problem. Receiver, receiver would be a problem. Be offensive line. line. Like there's, there's a lot of things that he wouldn't fix. So I feel like he would mask a lot of hack it though. Right. He, he would mask a lot of the issues, but and you I think, think about how many, sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, I, I think going into next year, like you're hoping you get one year out of Rogers. Uh, you know, maybe more, but it's probably one year and you want to maximize that as best you can. I think you look at this team and you should be honest with yourself that even if he did play, this wasn't going to be a Super Bowl team. That's what we've learned to this point. And we need to try to find a way to raise the ceiling. And I really do believe that coaching has to be a big part of that. Obviously, Hackett, we would all love to see that. I think if they could get a hotshot coordinator, put him under solid, that could work. But it doesn't feel like Hackett's going to go anywhere. <laughs> and even if they did do that, I think an offensive head coach at this point is a better decision because, like, we talk about it every head coaching cycle. Offensive head coaches We've had a lot. are the way to go in this league. Like, a lot of the good – the teams that are good consistently in the league today are the teams that can establish their offensive identity with an offensive head coach, and then they can maintain that throughout the years, whether it's Sean McVay, whether it's Kyle Shanahan, Andy Reid, Nick Sirianni is doing it with the Eagles – there's a lot of examples of that. That's the best way to go. And there are some good defensive head coaches, special teams head coaches, but the guys who stick in that role do it because they're great coaches. Like your John Harbaugh's, you want their bell chick in there, maybe Pete Carroll. Like these are guys who have proven like they are outstanding coaches. And Sala, even if he's not awful, which, you know, I'm sort of arguing at this point, but even if he's not that, at best, he's average. And as a defensive head coach, if you're just average, you're not moving the needle or establishing a consistent base for success in the same way that an offensive head coach is doing like a Kyle Shanahan, like all those guys I just mentioned, because it's an offensive league. It's a quarterback league. And if, when you have that, the head coach spot, I feel like that's the best way to truly establish that and maintain it for years to come. Like you could talk about culture all day and, you know, that being the basis of consistent success. And he's done an okay job in that department, I guess, despite, you know, the penalties and the, Players ranting on Twitter, so maybe not a great job. But despite that, I don't think culture is what the basis is. I think it's offense, offensive structure. 
That is what wins consistently in the NFL today. And I think you need a head coach to do that because offensive coordinator, if he's good, which the Jets haven't had a good one anyway, but if he is good, he's going to leave in a couple of years and be someone else's head coach. So right. at this point, I feel like you've got one more year with Rodgers, then you know you're moving on after that, hopefully finding a franchise quarterback. Salah's not moving the needle. He's not. He's as proven, at least he's not an amazing head coach. Maybe he's good. Maybe he's average, but he's not great, and he's a defensive head coach. Think, so I would right. like to try to raise the ceiling, get an offensive head coach, and get a new offensive coordinator, and let Sala, or let Rodgers help handpick that, those two guys if you want. That's what I would do personally. I know they're not going to do that. Salah's sticking around. So, so I you'd, let, you'd least, let Rodgers handpick the head coach? Not necessarily handpick, but like contribute. After, we've seen all of his other it. moves this offseason. <laughs> That's I true. Would... Kind of Peyton Manning-esque in terms of recommending Adam Gase. But um, I mean, just I only say that because recommend it feels Hackett. like, right? But like that's the reason I say that is because it feels like you know Hackett's his guy. Like if you tell him, oh, we're firing Hackett, we're firing Salah now, he's like, oh, okay, I'm out of here. I unretired for this. Like these are my guys, and they're going to fire them. So I would at least say like you can contribute to helping pick the new guy. But I don't know. That's me personally. I feel like Salah at this point has. And I don't want to write him off completely because, like I said, yeah. if you can fire Hackett, get a good offense coordinator, maybe you can make a better push next year, You know, fix some of the holes in the roster. I don't think it's totally impossible for him to be a successful coach in this league, to win a Super Bowl with the Jets. I don't think it's impossible, but it's becoming very close to that point to where it's like, what has he shown to where I can envision that? It's becoming hard to see that, especially with the toothpaste commercial. The, tooth, the toothpaste commercial was bad. I'll give you that. That's, that's yes, a nail in the coffin. Let, let's be real. Like, not, I was teeter-tottering before that, but then I saw no. that and I'm like, all right, that guy's not winning the Super Bowl with the Jets. I I think that, look, you made plenty of good arguments about Sala, but here's what I would come back to. He has been saddled with absolutely nothing on the offensive side of the ball. Right. And, that's and I understand yeah. that, you know, okay. I, I, Zach Wilson, probably on Joe Douglas. LaFleur? Probably on Sala, but if you go back and watch, LaFleur wasn't the worst offensive coordinator. He's certainly better than Hackett. I think the, the first two years of Sala's tenure, QB was a bigger issue than OC. And then this year, they go in for, for Rodgers. And I think the one thing that would kind of concern me is that they did hire Hackett before they knew they were going to get Rodgers. So if they had hired Hackett and didn't get Rodgers, and this was the product that we had in the field, and maybe we have Derek Carr or Jimmy Garoppolo or something, and we're seeing this shit, I would give a lot more credence to what you're saying about he hasn't shown anything. They're going to fire him. But I think every step of the way, most people would agree that the Jets didn't work out, but they took the right course. You think about their rookie year with Zach Wilson. He got saddled with one of the worst first round quarterbacks. A guy, look, I've defended him. I'm not, you know, certainly in this game proved that he's not the only issue. But his first year, he's, he's rebuilding the culture that Gase had left behind with a rookie quarterback. Not a good year. The next year, they turn, the, they turn the corner. The defense turns into one of the better units in the league. He has them at 7-4. and four, But yet again, the young quarterback is historically bad to the point that they put in an undrafted guy in Mike White, who I guess he had played a couple years before that, but a guy with little to no experience in Mike White who comes in, wins a couple games, has him at 7-4. and four. He gets injured. You're back to Zach Wilson. You lose the games down the stretch. And then they go into this offseason saying, okay, we have a great, we have a great defense. We got to fix the offense. They go, they push all their chips in the middle for a Hall of Fame quarterback and bring in the offensive coordinator that he had for back to back MVP seasons two years before that. They push all their chips in on Rodgers and it blew up in their face in the fourth play of the game. You can get mad at the Jets for not having a better contingency plan. You can criticize Sala for hiring Hackett as, as the OC. But the reality is, is that the players in the locker room respect him. They play hard for him. They have one of the best defenses in the league. Sure, the record isn't pretty, but he deserves another year. He deserves the year with Rodgers to, to see what they all envisioned when they they this is not the season they envisioned. And there's plenty to criticize. We're gonna get into that. Douglas isn't uh, above criticism as well, because there's you know plenty of questionable free agent signings and draft picks in there as well. But it's like, what more was Sala supposed to do these last couple of years? The best point you made outside of the the Colgate commercial is that hiring an offensive coordinator is probably your best chance at having cont continued offensive success in this league, and offense is king. But let's not act like people are, have short-term memory. They forget where the Jets were at as an organization in 2020 post-Gase. Just the absolute loser mentality that they had in that building and just the complete lack of hope that, I don't mean to say anything, Sala has been able to, and Sala and Douglas have been able to instill back in this organization. Now, look, the record isn't there. I would also point to there are a lot of coaches 
from Bill Parcells to Bill Belichick to Chuck Knoll to all the, I mean, you could pull up the number of Hall of Fame great coaches that have taken a few years to get their programs in order. I think the Jets have been victim to some bad decisions. Absolutely. Some mistakes all has been made and some just terrible luck. And it's like the fire and before you see what he could do with even just a competent offense just seems misguided to me. Like, I think, I think the one thing that, that Woody has hopefully learned is that I think continuity is important. I really do in this league. And I think if you fire your head coach every two or three years and replace him with somebody else and he's building his program up, I just don't, I think he deserves one more year. I think at the very least he gets his year with Rodgers and it'll be a big off season for, for Saul. Cause I'm not saying head shouldn't roll. I'm not, he really has to make a decision on Hackett. Can, can Rodgers play without Hackett? Can Hackett accept a demotion? You know, are you going to fire Todd Downing and maybe try to bring in some, some young hotshot to design your passing concepts, steal poach somebody from Miami staff or Detroit stats staff to redesign the offense and Hackett calls it and Rogers is running, whatever. He has to make some decisions. Absolutely. And, and also JD has to make some decisions in his cabinet. There should be guys who should get fired from this year. I just don't think it's wise to, to fire Sala before you get to see him with, with Aaron Rodgers. before you get to see what you tried to build this year. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, um, and, and I think that's fair. Like he, I still think he can. Again, if Hackett's out of here, because I don't trust that uh, Hackett offense, even if Rodgers is running the show, can be all that good. Um, so with a different offense coordinator, I do think he can. Salah can still get it done. I just feel like you know, like I said, you have one more year with Rodgers. That's what you're shooting for, and you want to make the most of it. I really feel like you can raise the ceiling if you shoot for something else. And I know it's, you know, maybe change for the sake of change. Maybe Ooh. Salah's liked in the locker room. Who are you hiring? I don't to have be, the list of with Har- I, We'll see. Like I would Harbaugh? have to look at the list. But, I mean, I don't know. I just feel like Salah as a head coach doesn't bring that much to the table at this point. I, I don't see how much, you know, worse the overall. I, I'm not going to, you know, act like this is the worst Jets team of all time and overreact. But at the same time, it doesn't. It feels like there's a lot more room to be better than Salah than there is be worse you could have it you could point. have a locker room not respect their head coach we've seen that before and i think Salah clearly has the respect to this locker room it's also like we, it's not like we've never seen him they, they were at seven and four oh, last Gates year had no so little respect he still won the same amount They're of games f- his first this season year no you also said they have with this team you also said something um and i don't want to interrupt but you said like they have to win perfect it's like that's not true how many games has Salah won with just absolutely no quarterback play this year last year his first year they've won plenty of ugly games at this defense and 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 also, like the other thing is, it's not like Salah has been immune but to how much any credit change. does he even get thing, for the defense? Because isn't he the CEO head coach? A lot it feels like Ulbrich's defense for the most part. No, it's it's Salah's defense. Yes, obviously he's put he's delegated a lot to Ulbrich, but let's not act like this isn't Salah's defense or he, that's not his forte. Like, yeah, Salah definitely deserves credit for the defense. You, there are a lot of things you can criticize Salah with. My only point is, I just think it's overreactionary to fire him after this year. They have six games left. There's plenty more room for this to get ugly and fans to be booing and the loud, the outside noise to get louder and louder. But just like you saw this week, all the outside noise about benching Zach, I don't think that's the biggest issue right now. I don't think Sala is the big. I don't think firing Sala is like, oh, there we go. That's the magic elixir. I think there's a lot of room to upgrade this offense. I just, But in terms of Sala as a head coach, that's where I really just think like I'd like to see him with his year with Rodgers. He has a lot of decisions to make this offseason. I think next year is a make or break year for him. How does he handle Hackett? How does he handle the rest of his coaching staff? How does he handle, you know, I guess JD's in charge of the personnel, so I'll, I'll let that slide. But there are decisions that he's going to have to make this offseason that will impact next year. And at the end of his four years, if you think, all right, that's enough, and you want to pull it and pull the ripcord on Sala, I get it. But I just think three years, considering his – Star Hall of Fame quarterback went down to the fourth play of, of the season. And perhaps the GM deserves blame for some of the other moves in season, not not making in terms of attacking receiver. Or a lot of people are upset about not bringing in a better backup quarterback or things along that nature. But in terms of the in-game stuff that Saul has done, I think the biggest criticism you can make of him is his hiring of, of Hackett, which I really think is strongly tied to thinking they could get Rodgers, which they did. So, and it's like, I guess the other thing you could say, the other criticism you could have of Salah is that he was late. I guess to make a lot of changes like benching Uzama, I mean benching Cobb, playing Cook less, playing Abanacanda. I don't even did Abanacanda play at all in this game. I don't think so. Did he have a Did he have a single snap in this game? I just dawned on me. So that's another but, um, criticism you can throw in there. I think he's 
very much shown a lot of favoritism to vets, to players who the team is invested in. And like yeah. at this point, yeah, he's benched a lot of those guys, but it is November 24th, and a lot of these decisions were obvious in week one. That we were talking about them on this podcast, some of them in the preseason. So, you know, it, it does feel like there's a sense of, like, we have to justify this investment. Or this guy is a veteran. He needs to play, and it takes a long time for him to bench those types of players. Yeah, except, you know, it's like he benched Zach twice. He benched him this year. He's benched Uzama. He, he did, and I actually will give him the Zach thing. Like, I think in general people are a little too quick to say, like, the Jets love Zach Wilson and all that. They benched him twice last year in his second season as second overall pick, despite the fact that he had a winning record. So I don't think that Zach Wilson is a problem in terms of Salah's, you know, management personnel. I actually think he's been very eager to bench Zach Wilson, but <laughs> – I mean, he even, you know, hinted this past week, maybe he didn't love the Zach Wilson pick. There was the comment he made, you know, they had some disagreements on the draft process or whatever with, with him and Douglas. But um, so I, I, I do Zach wonder Wilson's if maybe not part of that. Donald. I just feel like other veterans. Uh, yeah, I think there's a there's a I think here's the other thing on Sala, because I, I, I don't think he's above criticism. I just think I just push back on the whole fire Sala narrative. The other thing I think you can say is his philosophy in terms of and this is what you get when you have a defensive coach is way too conservative on the offense side of the ball. It's it's slightly better than Bowles in terms of fourth down aggressiveness, but this year especially has just been the most conservative and the worst offense. I mean, what was the stat they kept showing? It was like the worst third down percentage since like the 1950s. Yeah, worst third down or 50 years. Pretty much modern history, yeah. The, the, the philosophy of this Jets team and this Jets offense is just way too conservative. To I mean, they had one deep throw the entire game. Actually, two. Right. One was and, the Hail Mary. Don't you think that's another other- thing you could tie to Salah? Like, just the con- like, obviously, Hackett calls the offense, but it feels like the offensive mentality is an extension of Salah and his, how he wants to win games. Like the Raiders game, for yeah, example. Yeah, I, I just mentioned that. A- where he said, you know, it's a race to 20 points. And, like, don't you think that's something that, you know, I mean, maybe he's right because we know how bad the Jets' offense is. But from a mentality perspective, you can't think like, "Oh, we're we got to get twenty points to win this game." You got to think. I don't think score he... forty, even if you know you can't. You have to play with the mentality that you can because that's how you're going to get the best out of this offense is to not be yeah, afraid I, I of knew, making mistakes. I knew it was going to be a bad day when they just first play it was just Brees Hall run right up the middle. I was like, "Ah, oh, that's not the not the confidence start that that we wanted." Right. I think I don't think he would call the game like that if he had Aaron Rodgers. That's my point. And again, you can criticize the Jets for having absolutely zero contingency plan if Aaron Rodgers were to go down. But they put all their chips in the middle on Rodgers, and it blew up in their face in the most Jets fashion possible. I, I think the out of between Sala and JD, I actually think JD deserves a lot more of the blame than Sala. Do you, I mean, who do you think should bears the the majority of the blame? Because we we were looking at J. I have all of JD's drafts and free agent signings up in front of me. And there's, I mean, look, that 2022 class is going to save JD's job, coupled with bringing in Aaron Rodgers, I think. But you look through that 2020 class and that 2021 class, and granted, like I think fans have this conception of of draft classes are all supposed to be perfect. Like you look around the league, what do you think? Like if you can get two starters and two role players, that's a good draft. For yeah, the most something part. like that. You know, expectations so tw- should be should be modest for draft. And the classes. 2022 dr- draft class, he hit a bunch, so that covers him but you look through his record especially free agent signings especially this offseason pan- pandering to rogers the offensive free agent signings in particular i don't think he's hit on a single one outside of tyler conklin on the defensive side of the ball he's hit on dj reed i guess you could give him credit for quentin jefferson you could give him credit for for jfm and quincy williams and bryce huff so he, jd like you know just like i would say with Sala, i think he's done some good things he's probably done uh you know, just like I think JD can deserve more of the blame, he probably has more going in his favor with that 2022 class and luring in Sol- or luring in Rodgers. But you look around his record and the team that he's built. At the end of the day, like we're all talking about, this offense is so bad, and Hackett is is a real big issue. But they have literally nobody. I mean, they're playing Jason Brownlee, and Xavier Gibson as their starting receivers. Randall Cobb is back out there. They got Irvin Charles. It's like that falls on the GM too. And again, I know Corey Davis pulled the rug on them, but it's still like. Lazard's a healthy scratch today. They didn't do anything in, in the response to, to Corey Davis's retirement. They traded away Harbin for nothing when that was a bit of a luxury to do. Not that Harbin's been great or anything, but trading away your free agent receiver when you have nobody else behind him. JD's whole thing has been about constructing the offensive line. Like Sala, he's faced a lot of bad luck. ABT's had injury issues. Becton's had injury issues. 
but his free agent signings there haven't been good. In fact, his probably his two best offensive line free agent signings were Morgan Moses and George Fant, both of them who he let walk out the door. I don't think McGovern's been that good. Lakin Thomas has been a train wreck. Tibbin looks like he's going to be a good player. So hit or miss on the offensive line, but that was his, supposed to be his thing. And I don't mean to say anything. Does his offensive line look much better than it did last year or the year before or the year before that or the year before? It's like, so I'm, I'm firmly in the boat that I think everybody's going to get another year. There should be changes in the personnel, in the uh, front office and the personnel department, and there should be changes in the offensive staff, but Sala and JD, I think are staying, but there are plenty of things that we can now, we should now be criticizing a lot more openly. And, and, in my opinion, I think JD deserves a lot of blame for the way that he handled this offseason. I agree. And I would say, I would put it like this. In terms of this season, I would blame Douglas more than Salah for the effect on where they're at right now in terms of 2023. Because all the things you mentioned are spot on. And obviously, injuries have contributed a lot. But, you know, there are a lot of things we discussed this offseason that the Jets needed to do that they didn't do and are now paying for. Whether it's, like you said, not replacing... Corey Davis, when he retired, you know, that was unfortunate, but you had plenty of time to replace him and you didn't. You relied on Alan Lazard to be your wide receiver too. That didn't work out. He's already inactive before the end of November. Um, the offensive line, you did not emphasize, even though you knew you are bringing in a 40-year-old quarterback. You tried to go with Beckton again. He's our, I mean, he's stayed healthy for the most part, but he has not performed great when out there. Um, Dwayne Brown, you counted on him to start again, which was – very foolish. He's 38 years old. He didn't stay healthy last year. He didn't play well. So they, they didn't, they should have, we all talked about it at the beginning of the offseason, especially when they got Rodgers. You got to go all in and, you know, fortify this offensive line if you're serious about protecting him and, win, and winning the Super Bowl. And they pretty much, they drafted Titman. That's all they did. So they're very, and, uh, and they were and they got lucky with Beckton being able to play this many games too because he was no sure thing exactly like either the, he shouldn't have, have even been considered they actually got the best the om, almost line. the best case scenario with Beckton that he's played this many games and I know he hasn't been amazing or anything I know you've been kind of critical of him but like the fact that he's at least played this many games and been one of the better Jets offensive linemen it's like they got the best case scenario with Beckton and yeah. they were really banking on that yeah they took a very risky approach with the offensive line instead of you know, investing in it and playing it safe. They're trying to raise the floor as much as possible. And I know no one can prepare for, you know, everyone to get injured except Tomlinson at this point, pretty much. Um, no team can truly prepare for that. But even if the offensive line, you know, was a little bit healthier, it still probably wouldn't have been ideal because other than Tidman and AVT, no one's really played great this year. So they didn't fully emphasize the offensive line. They when wide receiver made a bad signing, which is just cards. so strange given their philosophy on offense. Right. Yeah. You know? it, it was, like you it look was, at Detroit. Strange. Yeah. You look at Detroit and they have, I mean, granted they have a creative offensive coordinator who likes to throw the ball, but they have like the same kind of CEO head coach, this tough mentality of we're going to run you over and play great defense. You look at what they built on that offensive line. And it's like, they have the ability to do that. And then the jets try to do that. And they got running right behind Xavier Newman and Max Mitchell getting blown off the ball every snap. And it's like, I don't know. I, I, I think both Sala and JD. There are plenty of things to criticize. I think JD, like you said, it probably deserves more of the blame for this season. I just think it. I think it's foolish to fire them this year. You know, I, I'm sure plenty of people disagree with that. You, did, you, by the way, you didn't even touch on giving Dalvin Cook seven million dollars, which right, yeah, I know we've and moved that past, as well, which, like, which I guess there are there could be, and that's another thing with Douglas. There could be multiple parties in the Cook signing. Like, did Rogers push for that, and then other pickups yes. they made. Did you have to get Lazar to get Rodgers and Cobb and Turner and all these other Green Bay cronies and Rodgers crew? Like, you know, maybe you alleviate some of the blame from Douglas because he felt like he had to get those guys. But at the same time, there's nothing stopping him from going harder on the offensive line at receiver, and he didn't do it. So, so yeah, that's my original point. I would blame Douglas more than Salah because he has more control over the product on the field right now, I would say, in terms of, the fact that you know they're mostly losing because they don't have talent out there right now. So I would blame Douglas more, but looking forward, I would say that I have more faith in Douglas and Salah just because I feel like Douglas has shown you signs, at, at least for me, and, and maybe you disagree, other people disagree, but at least for me, I feel like Douglas has shown me signs that he has a good idea of you know what he he's doing. It. Like he, he's whiffed on a lot of picks, he's whiffed on a lot of signings, but. I think he's emphasized the right things because he has tried in the offensive line. He's tried. It has not worked. It's gone terribly. 
but he's tried. And that is an upgrade over previous Jets GMs who didn't even try at all. Like when their last first round offensive lineman before Douglas was like mangled or whatever it was. So he's tried. He's emphasized the trenches on defense. Um, cornerback, he treated as a premium position. It is, even though people like me were saying, you know, he shouldn't have, but he did, and it's worked out great. Um, so I think he emphasizes the right things. He had a, one, really one of the greatest draft classes in recent history in the NFL in 2022, which buys him a lot of leeway because overall, outside of that, it hasn't been great. He's had some good gems in undrafted free agency, waiver pickups. Um, obviously, his free agency has been terrible. Uh, but I feel like there are some things you can point to and say, like, I could see Douglas, you know, building a good team. Because a lot of what you're hopeful about with this Jets team has to do with some of the pickups he's made. At the same time, some things you're, you know, pessimistic about that are causing this have to do with things he didn't do. But for me, I, I just look at Douglas and I see, like, I can picture it. With Salah, I, it's just getting harder for me to see, like, like you try to picture – the, you're at the Super Bowl, the, comp- the confetti's falling. Can I see that guy holding up the Vince Lombardi trophy? Can I see Salah doing it, especially after the toothpaste commercial? I, I don't know if I can, but Douglas, I, I have more. He's been bad. Like I said, I would put more blame on him for this year than Salah. But looking forward, I have more. If I had to choose one, well, the, the, I have the, more cause... faith in Douglas. Well, the, the problem with Salah, the problem we were kind of getting at earlier, is that he ha- he's you're you if you're a defensive coach you're beholden to your offensive coordinator he's reliant on being able to find a good offensive coordinator clearly he didn't find one in Hackett I think LaFleur had plenty of issues but he was better than Hackett if LaFleur was the offensive coordinator right now I think the offense would still suck but would definitely be better than what it is right now they went in on Rodgers it didn't work out the question becomes like all right let's say even if if Rodgers plays next year and it goes well, let's say I, I won't even go best case scenario. Let's just say Rodgers plays next year. They make the playoffs. They lose, but he, re, he retires happily ever after. You probably stick with Hackett for another year then, right? At that point, like then you're kind of tied to Hackett and then, okay, maybe, maybe you fire Hackett or whatever, ha- fire Hackett after this year. It's like, then it's is going to be on his third offense coordinator and you're trusting him to find the right guy to steer his ship. And a lot of the issues come in that philosophy of playing too conservative and playing defensively. Like I get what you're saying in terms of your criticisms with Sala, but I just think you look at what he's had to deal with on the offensive side of the ball. Granted he's a head coach falls on him, but if we could just see what he, what a Robert Sala coach team could look like with competence on the offense side of the ball, I think you'd feel a lot better about him being the head coach. And I don't mean to say anything. The other thing is who else is out there? You know, hire Jim Harbaugh. That's that's the big name I've seen floated around, and besides being a Harbaugh, I don't know if that that just seems like that's going to be disaster. But I don't I don't know enough about Jim Harbaugh to be. Yeah, I, guess, I don't I don't really know. Maybe I guess my you, could, you could hire be different. You could hire Ben Ben Johnson, uh, another I offense love, coordinator. I love but you Ben have, Johnson for sure. But you love his offense, but you have no idea what he would be like as a head coach. You know, like there are a lot of th- some guys make a good coordinator and they don't make a good head coach. The one thing about Sala is he knows how to command a room. He has the respect of his locker room. He do, he has instilled a good culture in New York. Guys, the like, thing there's I, a lot I'm that he does like, that is, we don't see as fans because like, we're not in the building. Like the things culture is supposed to affect, we're not seeing. Like in terms of on the field, like we're still seeing dumb personal fouls consistently, which sometimes it's just a bad mistake by the player. That's but not we've been seeing it really consistently at this point. And Those, you know, okay, so we're seeing players offense, rant on social media constantly. We're seeing blowout losses. So I, I don't time. know. I feel like the culture thing is overrated when it's not translating to the field uh, there's okay there's been a few instances of social media they traded away the the primary culprit in elijah moore there's been a few cryptic tweets from becton and Brees and jordan whitehead and those guys but nothing crazy when you look around the league michael that's kind of a league-wide problem that's just the generation of, of players now that's they have an outlet We're overrating the culture because you can't preceded by adam gaze if he wasn't preceded by gaze we wouldn't be giving him I disagree with that. that. I think most people around the league watched Hard Knocks and said, well, damn, this solid guy is a great head coach. I'd want to play for him. I've heard a lot a lot, a lot of former players have kind of said that. A lot of former players respect Sala as, as a coach when you look around the league. I mean, yeah, maybe the culture as a whole is overrated. Like Jonathan Gannon, the, the, the Cardinals coach, everybody shat on him because he just seemed so awkward and he had that terrible speech or whatever. But it's like, not that the Cardinals have been that good, but like <laughs> they probably offensively been better than the Jets and he's a defensive guy. Um I, I get all the arguments you're making. My only point is I just think it's it's early to pull the ripcord on Sala without seeing this vision through. 
You know, they they did it. They landed the Hall of Fame. What quarterback is his vision? He had thirty different slogans Rogers. this offseason. Is it sixty percent? Is it all gas, no break? Is it if you ain't got no haters, you ain't popping? Which one is it? I'm kind of losing track at this point. It's that the defense is going to be top five in the league, which they are, and okay. Rodgers is going to steer the offense. And Rodgers is going to get you at the very least league average off offense, maybe better. And then come playoff time, you have a Hall of Fame quarterback who knows how to win in the clutch. That's that's the that's the offense. And then this offseason, you're hoping that JD is going to go ahead and bolster the offensive line, bolster, bolster the receiver room, and you enter next year with an even better team that, than you had in August, and the expectations will be even higher. And then if it blows up in their face again, then I get the argument to move on from solid. But I think you have to see the vision through. They hired, they brought in Rodgers. They got the big cat. He goes down in the in the in four plays. And now we're gonna fire everybody in November. We said it. We said it after the first game. We said the season's over. Like <laughs> no matter, we won't say that in November. We'll be pointing to all the other different reasons the Jets lost. But make no mistake, the reason we were all excited was the Jets had a legitimate shot to win a Super Bowl this year, and it just ended in four plays. And the other big criticism people have, and this might be something for its JD, I kind of disagree with it, though, is there's a lot of people saying that the Jets should have traded for a, for a better backup quarterback, which I think completely ignores the context that they were 4-3 and three at the trade deadline, so that's part of the reason they, they didn't do that. Um, I think you can maybe make the argument that, okay, maybe they trade for a Josh Jobs or a Jacoby Brissett. How many, how many more games does that get them? Because clearly you watch this game, and I'm not saying Tim Boyle is an amazing backup or anything, but... This, this offense has a lot more problems than quarterback. So let's say you go and you ship off more draft capital for a Josh Dobbs or a Jacoby Brissett in a likely lost season, considering your Hall of Fame quarterback went down, who's also, he's still lingering like he's going to come back at the end of the year, which probably factored the decision a little bit. Like if Zach Wilson stunk against the Chiefs and they didn't win the, some of those, win three in a row and beat the Eagles and they're at the trade deadline, yeah, then yeah, I think they would have made a move for a Ryan Tannehill or some somebody. But at the time of the trade deadline, they were four and three. Rogers is thinking about coming back. He already went down. Do you want to sink more draft capital into it? Like, I just don't. I don't think a Josh Dobbs is making a difference. Sorry, Connor Hughes. Like, I just don't think that behind this offensive line and with these weapons, he's. Do you think he's beating? Do you think he's winning this game? You think he's beating the Bills? Even the Raiders like, game. In the I know Zach Wilson. Season, they should have addressed that. I know, but which games is that getting them? Like, that's the QB is not the big issue right now. Like, it is an issue, but Hackett, no Rodgers with Hackett is the big issue. Hackett with Rodgers, fine. No Rodgers with Hackett. I don't, but who are you putting in there? That's Russell Wilson sucked last year with him. And Russell Wilson's not amazing or anything, but like, that's a starting quarterback. It's like, I just don't understand the, the that's, that's the reason the Jets aren't going to make the playoffs, that they didn't trade for a backup quarterback. But I don't know if you, if you have feelings on that. Um, I just don't what game well, no, is, is I, I Josh Dobbs winning? I don't think during I, the Patriots I, game. I don't think they should have traded for one in season. I still think in the offseason they should have done it. If they, you know, wanted to keep Zach Wilson, it should have been this is his red shirt year. He's gonna stick around and learn. We don't want him to play unless it's an emergency. Let's get a better veteran backup who gives us a better chance to win if Rodgers goes down. Um the only one I think turns is the Patriots game, because I think there were plays to be made there that maybe like a average backup quarterback makes, um, which I think Zach Wilson is, but maybe like a, high, a higher end backup quarterback would he make was still, like yeah. Gardner Minshew, Brissett, maybe even yeah. Mike White. Although that, that's an interesting conversation too, whether or not you want him back. But um, I think a guy like that wins the Patriots game. Other than that, yeah, I don't – Cowboys was a blowout. Chiefs, Zach Wilson played well. Chargers was a blowout. Raiders, maybe, but I mean, he still made some good plays in that game that weren't – they weren't caught, and there were plenty of other issues. Obviously, the last two were blowouts. So, I mean, maybe they have one more win with a you know higher level backup quarterback right now. Um, so, yeah, I yeah. think they should have done that in the offseason. I don't think trade deadline was an option. Yeah, I mean, like again, who knows how those games would have unfolded with a different. But I just think the argument that we're all acting like, oh, because the Jets didn't trade for that has to be the narrative now. Is like it switched from its. It's Zach Wilson's terrible. Let's bench Zach Wilson. That'll fix everything to no. Well, they just needed to bring in a better bet. It's like the quarterback. Okay. Sure. is not the solution right now. Not the biggest issue. Hackett's the number one right. issue. I'd say receivers. Well, you know, O-line's probably next and then receivers probably third and then quarterback Qu quarterback isn't a top three issue on this offense and quarterback's not good. So this off season, they have a lot of work to do. I think the, the barring the jets ripping off three in a row, Rogers should not play. At all, they, the Jets won't rip three in a row off. I'm just saying, unless the Jets are at are at seven and seven, at that point, 
that what they would be? They'd be seven and seven. Yeah. Unless you're in that, but that Rogers pipe dream can go. I know he wants to play come hell or high water to prove that he can do it, to put that on his Just let him take mantle. a snap so he can make the history. Yeah, you could take one QB kneel, get out of there, but it's just not worth it. And, you know, we'll still be doing these pods and talking and previewing games and stuff, but I, at this point, it does feel like kind of we're shifting our attention towards towards next year. I just there, there are just too many weaknesses on the offensive side of the ball to overcome unless you have a Hall of Fame quarterback. And even then, you know, even then, I, I don't know exactly where the Jets would be this season. Um, well, one more thing else? about uh, – kind of a moot point anyway, because like you said, I don't think he's getting fired. But one more thing about why I would fire Salah is you look ahead to next year and say, Rob, you know, Aaron Rodgers plays the whole season. He plays well. You have a good year, nine or ten wins, lose the first playoff game, maybe you win one. If that happens, which is your – realistic best case scenario then based on that success you're bringing Salah back again the next year and probably hack it like you said now you're in 25 and you still have these guys and based on what we've seen here these first three years and this year it like like you're like you're saying you know you got Rodgers that was the plan and everything you know went to hell when he got injured but if that's what it takes for a solid team to be good, then you know what is he bringing to the table? That's just the question I ask. So, if, if okay, the only thing, the only thing I would say, what long term after Rodgers is gone, do we have faith that Salah can do it without an Aaron Rodgers? That he can build something consistent that can withstand injuries, that can withstand. Maybe you don't have the greatest quarterback this year. I the fact that they were seven and four last year, that. they were seven, they, they were seven and they four, lost and, six and in Mike, a row. if we can't just take because and Mike White got injured. And they lost Mike a White couple of games with Mike White when he played. They lost well, one too. game with Mike White playing the whole game, and then the next one he got just ripped in half in Buffalo. And oh, he still they still would have lost if he stayed in. He played most. I don't of know, the game. but you remember? You remember he came back and he started driving again. No, Joe F- Joe Flacco fumbled. Whatever, we don't have to go back to a year ago. But no, they they were at least in that game, and they and we are one Braxton Berrios dropped one yard pass from being eight and four. So I think we have seen something to be like, all right, he can win without having Aaron Rodgers as a quarterback. That's why we were all so excited. Very little thing to hold on to. Yeah. Very, very. Yeah, small but he's been sliver. in the league. For, he's only this is towards Three the end of his third season. Three years. Okay, his first there year coming aren't off. A lot of, of guys play. can point to. We were looking at him before this, and you're like Chuck Knoll, fifty years ago. Are not a lot of great Fair. examples. Chuck and you Knoll throw was, Belichick uh, in there, but Chuck, even Belichick. Chuck Knoll was had 20 Chuck wins his uh, first lost three years. 30 of his first 42, and then he had four rings by the end of the decade. So just saying. But um, <laughs> I know it's a different game. The one thing I would say to you, though, is what more did you, what more could Salah have done these these three years when you look at it? Like his year one, he's taking over for Gase in one of the worst situations in the entire league, and they draft what turns out to be a likely bust at quarterback, and Becton gets hurt. What all that? So, okay, first year, it's his first year installing the program. They suck. Whatever. You accept that. Year two, he's again saddled with a terrible quarterback, and he gets him all the way to seven and four. The backup quarterback who who'd won a couple games with Mike White, it's not like he's starting anywhere, gets injured. They throw Zach Wilson back out there again, and they lose those games at the end of the year. They miss the playoffs, and now that you're here. You push all your chips in on Rodgers, and, and it blows up in their face. And the main culprit right now is Hackett and the lack of talent on offense. How are any of those things solid? The, the, the thing that's all his fault is hiring Hackett. Hackett. Yes, yeah, but that, in my opinion. opinion, they hired Hackett. Okay, the one thing I'll say, though, is did they hire Hackett because they thought they were going to get Rodgers? Most likely yes. they did. Uh, th- yeah. Yes. So that's why they did it. They, uh, they hired Hackett, and they brought in Lazaro because they thought they were going to get Rodgers, which we agreed with. It's a Hall of Fame quarterback. You pair him with this great defense. It's like your other option was Derek Carr, who hasn't been that good, and Jimmy Garoppolo, who's already been benched. So that's why I just look at it. It's like, uh, yeah, there are little things you can point to and, and philosophical things with, with Sala and the fact that he's a defensive guy, not an offensive guy. Like there, there are little seeds to talk about. And if, if this doesn't work out for another year, you fire him. But it's like, I look at those first three years. It's like he was kind of in a lose-lose situation with just the luck that, that he was handed. And the one thing I would say is if, if he had hired Hackett, I can't say they, they hired Hackett thinking they were going to get Rodgers. If he had hired Hackett and not gotten Rodgers, this would be a different discussion because now you'd say, "Well, you fire the floor and brought in this guy. This guy's terrible," and that would be a different conversation. But in my opinion, this whole Jets organization pushed all their chips in on Rodgers, and it ended on the fourth play of the, the season. That's just how that's just how it went. That's just life as a Jets fan. So it is what it is. I, I agree. I, I just feel like it. You know, there's a certain bar, and we'll, we'll see how the rest of the season goes. But there's a certain bar that you know the excuse carries you. 
Two, like, okay, we'll give you this much leeway for the injuries. But it just feels like like historically bad offensive numbers, ugly blowout losses on prime time. It's going to be three straight years out of the playoffs, at most seven wins. And, like, it doesn't have to be that bad all the time. It feels like teams can overcome that. The Colts with Shane Steichen, they're in their first season, like Salah was in 21. They had no expectations this year. Their starting quarterback got hurt. They're five and five, and they're in the wild. Yeah, card they had mix. Gardner Minshew, not Zach Wilson, though. Exactly. Well, I'm, which is a guy the Jets should have signed, but again, should have signed. But again, it—he's Gardner Minshew. He's not the most amazing quarterback in the world. Yeah, it, but he's one. Of them. And are we just going, which, I, going to tie Salah to the quarterback? He—he he needs a great quarterback. That's the only way he can win. I just well, if he has a terrible quarterback and a terrible offensive coordinator, he's not going to win. It, the problem is the problem is the OC. And that is really – this is why I would say you can fire Salah after, after next year. It's like this is the big decision for Salah this offseason, what to do with Hackett. Would Hackett accept a demotion down to quarterback's coach so he can be Roger's little buddy down there on the sideline and they can work stuff out? Does, does, does Hackett allow uh, – a you know you poach somebody from Miami staff or Detroit staff or some, San, whatever to be the passing game coordinator and design the help design the passing concepts? Like whatever Salah does, he has to make changes on the offense side of the ball with coaching that he can't bring, he can't run it back with Keith Carter, Todd down and Nate Hackett, Calabrese. Let's party. Like he just can't do that. JD is knows. He's also, you know, he's on the hot seat as well. JD's going to go all in on, on O line and receiver. It's, but what is, it's what, what is, what is solid do with his offensive coaching staff this off season? He has to make changes. If, if there is a way to fire Hackett and still, and Rogers would be cool with it and Rogers understand it. I would definitely do that. I just, I don't know if they can. So, you got to explore all avenues. It, you know, if, if Hackett has to stay as OC, you got to bring somebody else in as the passing game coordinator to help re- reinstall, redesign the offense. If Hackett could accept a demotion, you do that. But otherwise, you are completely beholden to Aaron Rodgers, and you better hope he doesn't get hurt. Because if he gets hurt and Hackett's out there calling plays with, I don't care who you bring in next year as your backup quarterback, with your Gardner Minshew, it's going to be ugly again. Maybe it'll be a little bit better because the personnel should be better. But, you know, there's they're stuck with – with Hackett, it seems like. So, is is that is that on Sala? Would would you if you would if I were to ask you in March? I think I did. If you're hiring Nate Hackett, obviously we hate it, but if you get this Hall of Fame quarterback Aaron Rodgers, would you do it? Everybody would say yes, and the Jets did too, and it blew up in their face. So, I don't know. I guess that's it for us, unless we want to talk about Jordan Whitehead allowing his seventh touchdown of the season. Yeah, I know the <laughs> we could, you know what we can't say is the offense has been so bad that the defense doesn't get any of the uh, scrutiny. The defense the last two weeks has been they missed know. Michael uh, Carter. His impact has been demonstrated these past yeah, two games. Pick I think. Six. How much did, of it do you did. think is if if you're on the defense and you're on this team, it's like this off our offense can't do anything. I'm playing on this shit MetLife turf. Am I really going to lay my bot? I, I mean, I, I know they're still playing hard and stuff, but it's like. There's a part of me that's just like when your offense is doing nothing, your defense is on the field the entire game. Like they had that one drive in the second half where I think it was 15 plays. They had the ball for like nine minutes. It's just like at the end of that drive, I'm sorry if I'm one of those defensive vets. It's like I signed up for a Super Bowl year with Aaron Rodgers, and here I am. Our offense has six points, and it's the 14th play of the drive. It's just it takes a toll. So that's why I think I'm hesitant to criticize anybody on defense. But Whitehead missing missing another tackle. On a seven touchdown. Was there a part of you that was happy? Let's just be honest. Or were you were you upset that they allowed a touchdown? Did no, you feel vindicated? I mean, a little bit. But, I mean, I still root for every player in the team, whether it was Cook this year, Uzama. I, most important is the Jets winning. But if they are, if they are going to <laughs> fail, it, it, it would be nice to be like, all right, I, I told you. I kind of said that was going to happen. But no one agreed. Well, but, he, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh man, how this this season evolved so quickly. Oh, you're so excited. It's all right. We're gonna we're gonna get our hopes up just in time for next year. Don't worry. We're gonna have a whole off season to let it build. They're gonna make some big moves. They'll trade for Devonte Adams. We'll be all excited about the Super Bowl run next year. Thirty two year old Devonte Adams. And then, of course, Rodgers is going to come back and not be the same, and it'll just be more depressing bullshit, and they'll fire everybody, and we'll be back here in 2025. All right, so I don't want to be cynical. This is why we don't do the podcast immediately after the game. It's just too too cynical, <laughs> too depressing. But 
I swear, we're going to see that solid Colgate ad all throughout the rest of the season. I I cannot believe they got the pick six. They're right back in the game, and you throw a pick six on a Hail Mary. Never see has that happened in the NFL? Did anyone look up the history on that yet? Part of it, I think I'd have to rewatch it, but I don't know. I just remember as soon as it got picked off, I was like, not that I immediately thought he would score, but I was like, he's got a lot of room. It it just played out in a way where it was like everyone was behind him, and you know, all that's in front of him is O lineman and a quarterback, and Brees Hall is out there too, but he got blocked. So was the seemed like he's was there not good hang time on that throw? I was trying to rewatch. Was there was there not? The one thing I think you can say about it is it, it was short of the end zone, so that kind of gave him. Also, there's a clear pass interference. I know they never call it, but I think it's Brownlee just gets absolutely tackled before the ball, before the before the ball arrives, and then it's just like you know Car- Carter Warren kind of slows up. Garrett Wilson doesn't kick it into an extra gear. Mitchell and Tittman blow it, and then you're left with Boyle trying to save the touchdown. And then Garrett Wilson also didn't really try at the end either. Brees Hall got pancaked. I mean, it's just. You know, that people are laughing like that's some crazy. I know it's never happened, but it's like, okay, but I've seen them run back a field goal before. It's not that much different. It's it's a lot of open space and everybody trying to tackle one guy. Like it, it was like, it just turned into a kick or, kickoff. In fact, a harder kickoff because you had nobody running full speed. You know, you had offensive linemen out there trying to cover him. I don't know. The solid Colgate ad was way more embarrassing than the fail Mary. And we're going to have to deal with that stupid commercial for the rest of the season into the playoffs. And I'm telling you, the only reason they cast so I, from Saul's perspective, I get he has like eight kids or something. He's got a lot of college tuitions to pay. Okay, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> get your, but like, why? Why would you agree to do that commercial? What? I just that to me was the best argument for firing Saul. <laughs> it's a complete lack of awareness. Clearly, Colgate is hiring you because the because either the Jets are good and it's like, all right, we, we got this guy who looks like you know Vin Diesel or whatever. He's straight out of Central Casting for a head coach. We got him, or the it's all Jets and we can play this when the Jets suck. And Barstool and everybody else can run wild with it and post it on Twitter and free promo for Colgate. Yeah. Like, toothpaste? Like I said, I'm Held definitely your soul not, for toothpaste? Definitely not going to lie to you. Seeing that is what kind of pushed me over the edge. Like, I was definitely getting a little frustrated before that. Like, but I'm done with this. Once guy. I saw that, I was like, all right, I'm going in. <laughs> <laughs> you open yourself up to it with this, Sala. Uh, all right. I we'll be back this week. Uh, Even though maybe we'll, I influence his coaching because clearly he's taken some of my stats before. All right, don't let's not get your <laughs> head get too big. No, I'm um, taking responsibility. He's he's a great coach. It's my fault. <laughs> um, uh, we'll be back sometime next week. This is a weird schedule. I, I mean, don't know one exactly of his players when. reads my art, literally reads my articles and posts screenshot it and it. posted it, and then allowed a <laughs> touchdown. <laughs> so I mean. That is, I'm, I'm sorry. I don't want to sell. I, I, okay, you know the one thing I will say about Whitehead? Because uh, I've defended him more. I know you've always, you know, you've, you've been saying since the beginning of this guy. I've been like, oh, he makes some big plays. Uh, I did meet him one time before a game. He was pretty nice, took a selfie with me. You didn't, you just chose not to be in the photo, partly because I think you'd already known that you'd criticized him. Yeah. <laughs> but he's a cool guy. So, I, you know, he's, a, you know, whatever. Um. All right. Uh, I think that's it. Anything else? Unless you want to talk about Tim Boyle and Zach Wilson. We didn't really talk about it the entire pod. Just the difference in quarterback. They did make the quarterback change. Any thoughts on it? I mean, I think this kind of showed what we've been saying. That, you know, anyone who thought Zach Wilson was the only problem with his offense. Yeah, Connor Hughes. <laughs> was clear. Who Didn't he, like, switch up his opinion? He's. I don't know. He puts a backwards hat on and films himself walking to the stadium to just give garbage opinion after garbage opinion. Nobody respects that that guy. At least I don't. And I know you don't. But um, nonetheless, um, I think the the tone that he uses to ask questions in press conferences annoy me. And like, I get maybe it's just the Jets are bad. So I just got beat up on a beat reporter. Every time he asks a question in post game, I want to smash my phone against the wall. Definitely designed (laughs) to like incite, you know, get them to. Robert. If you're not going to – I shouldn't. I'll, I'll, go I'll, I'll behave. I'll behave. I'm sorry. Behave. I, I'm, I'm like <laughs> I, I did during the game today. You, you should, Everyone listening, you should see my angry text that I sent to Ben. Oh there's, there's some unhinged <laughs> stuff in here that I would not say if I was on on the phone with him or calling him. I was calling him some stuff. Not, nothing, nothing vulgar, <laughs> but definitely like – I was like, okay, bucko, you're wrong. Okay, bud. <laughs> okay, idiot. <laughs> 
It's fine. It's fine. I get it. This has just been a shit show of a season. No, well, I mean, I wish I wish our boy Boyle had a better game, but I mean, unfortunately, it's he you know, did come reason, through in my party. He's the third string quarterback. I I just don't know he, why Simeon's not ahead of him on the depth chart. Like, is he struggling that much in, in practice? I think it'll be Simeon next. It'll be Simeon next it week. Definitely, I think. I think it's very likely it's Simeon next week. But like, he's by it's far shit. the most productive of the three quarterbacks for his career. <laughs> watch watch know. Simeon rip three in a row, and then then we're right back at seven and seven. We're like, all right, wasn't he on the Falcons <laughs> like last year and he got cut? So Simeon revenge game. Incoming, yeah, maybe that's true. Um, I will say for Boyle, he did come through and hit the over on his passing yards and won me fifty dollars in a parlay. So I'll take that. What was well, what I'm, was I'm, the number? One hundred and seventy-four and a half, I think. Wow, I would I would have hit that. Might have might have been one seventy-five. Based on garbage time, which that's I, which what I bet happened. on. No, you want to hear the parlay? This is this is how sad you knew he would throw like Jets forty offenses. passes because they'd be down. Do you want to hear us? You want to hear this parlay just so you can get a sense of how sad the Jets' offense is? I put five dollars on this to win fifty-two. It was Tim Boyle over uh, Tim Boyle to have 176 yards. Jeremy Ruckert needed seven yards. Jason Brownlee needed ten yards. <laughs> Gibson needed two catches, and Garrett Wilson needed five catches. That was took the over on all that, and five bucks paid fifty two dollars. That's the state of the Jets' offense. Brownlee was our starting receiver. Is it nine and a half. <laughs> all right, uh, let's get out of here. Follow us at CJ Pod on Twitter. Michael, Michael underscore Anania. My myself, Ben W. Blessington. Yeah, there we go. Hold on. There we, nice. You twinning with Sala. Um, uh, go to JetsXFactor.com. Best place to go for Jets content. Check out the other JetX pods. Subscribe to the YouTube. If you can, rate, review, subscribe on iTunes. That's it. Michael, last thoughts? Is this the last time we'll ever see these black unis? I'd stop watching the Knicks game. We got a podcast to finish. It was a close game. Three-point game with a minute 15 left. Actual All right. Confident I'll, New York do, sports do you, team. Last thoughts? Last thoughts? Um. All black could be the last time we've ever seen it. Do you think they'll make some sort of black alternate? If if they yes. bring in like throwback or any type yes. of new u- uniform next year, I think they would definitely do it. New unis, new unis next year. I would keep a black alternate. I know it's an unpopular take with uh, with some Jets fans. I like the black unis once a year. I, I like it. I just still don't know if I like the all black with green helmet better or with the current black matte <laughs> okay. helmet. This is Michael in autopilot. He's his brain is fully focused on the Knicks, but his he's able to with his subconscious. I can always just, just default uniforms. to uniforms. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> okay, let's get out of here. Anytime right, I'm in a we're conversation, out, we're like, done. We're like, done. Oh, I don't know what to talk about. Jets uniforms. And the other person's we're done. like, oh, uh, okay. We'll be back this week, uh, sometime in the middle of the week, maybe Thursday or something. Maybe we'll do a mailbag. Who knows? That'll do it for us. Thank you everybody for for listening. Hope everybody had a great holiday. We'll be back next week. Go Jets.